All right, can, can everybody see the screen now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you, Osni, for the uh, introduction. <clears throat> so I'm going to be talking today about bringing best practices to a long-lived um, production code. And um, before I start, let me give a disclaimer here. Okay, um, this talk is going to fall into two basic parts. One will be kind of a general philosophy part, and the other is a case study part. And the general part, the general part, based on what I've heard from a lot of other projects, seems to apply to many long-running scientific software projects. So it is likely that if you're in such a project, you will recognize a lot of the things I'm talking about. Now, for the case study, that um, is more specific to our project. Uh, the things I talk about there may or may not apply to your project. Um, take them as examples of what you might do if they're applicable to you. So bear that in mind as I go through the talk. So the outline of the talk will be I will start talking about the problems that are faced by long-lived scientific codes. I'll say a bit about the case study of Lanel's experience in the X-ray code, X Rage code project, and then I'll end with a few recommendations for other projects that might want to go through a similar kind of transition. So let me start by talking about the characteristics of long-lived scientific codes. Uh, if you're like me, you've been involved in the if, if you've been watching this um, webinar series on best practices. There's been a lot of good information. But I have noticed that sometimes the discussions assume, maybe just implicitly they assume, that you're starting up a new project and a new code, and you have a lot of say in how things are going to be done as you go. But um, the question is, what if you have an ongoing project that's years old or even decades old? Um, what can you do to introduce best practices? given that you probably already have a large pre-existing code base that is written in a certain way um, that might not match what you'd like to do going forward. You probably have an existing code team that has established habits of how they do things and changing those habits might not be easy. And you likely already have a significant user base that might overlap with your development team, or it might be a separate group of people. But in either case, you've got a set of people who are already using the code regularly to get work done, and probably have continuing work that they need to be done, and you have to not uh, disrupt them with whatever you do in terms of changes in the code. So those are all challenges that are specific to long-lived codes. And often, codes that are like this have major challenges to software quality. They will, um, because they have been concentrated on meeting user needs, they will have complex and hastily written code. There will often be incomplete testing or inadequate documentation. There will often be little or no software process. And Underlying all those things, there will be a culture in the project that says, well, why should we do any of this fancy process stuff? We're getting along fine without it. So th those tend to be challenges that are specific to these kinds of long-lived code projects. So in responding to that, my, my first observation is that a project like this needs to think about, what do you mean when you say the project is getting along fine? Historically, in a lot of the projects I've observed, what that means that the code, what that means is that the code has the capabilities that the users want in order to get their work done, and has them as soon as possible. They're developed quickly, they're handed off to the users, and the users can go forward. And typically, that's it. That's the entire definition. Now, there are some advantages to this definition. The approach can be successful in the short term, you can build up a capable code very quickly. You can build up a user base that can get their work done with the code, and they can use it, the users can use it to meet their deliverables, 
write the papers that they need to write, get the grant renewals for ongoing work, and so forth, and in general, just do what they need to do in the short term. And there's value to that. But there are problems that if you continue with this approach, there are problems that show up in the longer term. You end up with code that, um, because you're writing the code so quickly, um, you end up with code that is hard to understand. You end up with a design that is largely ad hoc because you haven't had the opportunity to think through as you add all these features on how they fit together. You end up with, and because of these two things, you end up with code that is difficult for your code team to maintain, um, maintain the current capabilities or to extend it to new capabilities. You have code that is difficult for new team members who are coming onto the team to learn and to work with and to contribute to. And another factor that's become a bigger thing in more recent years, you have code that is difficult to optimize for new architectures. If you find out you have to start running on a Xeon Phi or a GPU or something like this, you have code that's very difficult to adapt and run well on those architectures. And a good way to sum up all of these longer term issues is you have a code that is not sustainable. You can't keep up or you have a very difficult time keeping up for the long term the pace that you had starting out in the short term. So that's a typical definition for getting along fine. I would suggest that a modern, better definition of what it means for a project to be getting along fine is that you have a code that is understandable and maintainable, and it's well written in other words. You have code that is extensible, it can take on new features when it needs to. You have code that is well tested so you can have a strong confidence that it's actually doing what you mean for it to do. You have code that is well documented so users can understand how to do what they want to do and developers can understand what the code is doing so that they can go in and make their changes. You have code that is portable to modern architectures. As I say, that's more and more an issue for a lot of these big scientific codes. And alongside of all those things, you still have the definition that you started out with. You want to have a code that does have the capabilities that the users want. At the end of the day, that's why you're doing this, so that you can support producing all the results that you need to produce. And you want to get your capabilities out to the users reasonably quickly, maybe not at breakneck speed like has been like some codes have traditionally done, but in a timely manner so that the users can pick them up and use them when they need to. And if you have a code that is doing all these things that has balanced all of these concerns well, this is more sustainable for the long term. It enables your code to last for years or even decades. And it allows you to um, keep up the pace of um, supporting your users, adding capabilities in the short term. It allows you to continue to keep up that pace for the longer term. So I would maintain that that is a better definition for what it means for a software project to be getting along fine. <laughs> Hi, Charles. I'm going to interrupt you there. Um, one quick comment. You seem to be fading in and out in your audio, um, so I don't know if you could just maybe lean into your speaker. And then the other uh, comment is that we have gotten a question, and I think now might be a good time to stop and uh -huh. ask, ask you the question, which just verbatim says, isn't the answer getting along fine an answer based entirely upon use and not at all upon development? If the same question was asked of the developers, the answer would certainly not be getting along fine. So isn't it the case that the question of the code's health cannot be answered solely by the users? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I would say that the users may, if the users are able to do what they do now, what they're doing now, they may think that the code is getting along fine. But if the developers are having a harder and harder time providing that same level of service, that they perhaps, if they're losing people and the people coming on board cannot give the same level of support, or if even the existing team members are having a harder and harder time 
giving the level of support that the users need, then the users may not know it, but as the project continues, they won't be getting along fine anymore either. So there's perhaps a lag as to when the users realize it, but in time, the users will not be getting along fine either. That would be my answer. Thank you. Okay. So let me go on I and mean, fix my audio a little here. Hopefully this will, this will work better. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So another observation that I've made over time is that when you look to change practices in a project like this, that is going to require changing the values and the culture of the project. When a project starts up, it decides what kinds of things it values, and it will grow a culture that reflects those values. It will start um, a lot of the practices and ideas that happen in the project will flow from what the project thinks is important. And this can affect many aspects of the code project. It can affect what languages and programming models you, and what tools you use, or perhaps you don't use because you don't think they're important. It will affect the staffing of the project. How many developers do you assign to work on the project? What is the background of those developers? It is, is it going to be entirely domain scientists? Or are you going to bring some in people, bring in some people with a computer science or software engineering background? Uh, how will training and career development be done? Will your developers um, be supported in going to classes in software engineering practices or conferences on that subject? Or will, the, will those things be strictly limited to things that are directly about the domain science? Performance evaluations. When your manager at the end of the year evaluates how you've done, will they value the fact that you've done just one or two capabilities really well, or will they ding you for not having done five or six capabilities quickly in the same time frame? Um, tasking and scheduling and deliverables. How, what things are going to be put on the task list? How much time will be allotted for them? Will you be allotted time to do some of these best practices? Or will it be routine that the only time that's allotted is time for just barely getting the code written? All of these things are driven by the culture, by the values and then the culture of your code project. And they will all reinforce each other. They will push the project in a certain direction that, um, that is consistent with those values. And it's very hard, I've seen this happen, it's very hard to try to change that direction if you don't at least partly change the values and the culture that drives all of these forces in the project. I have seen examples where one developer or even a few developers might start thinking about you know, changing practices in some way that's more consistent with best practices. But they find before they get too far that the, the culture around the project pushes them back in the direction that the, uh, that the project has traditionally gone, and it's very hard to make headway unless you start changing some of these cultural aspects of the project. Another observation that I've made over time is that changing the practices can require changing the code in the project. Some of the best practices that we've been talking about in these series and sometimes the modern tools that you might set out to use have built-in assumptions that come with them, perhaps that you don't realize right away, but there'll be assumptions that older codes might not satisfy. Um, a simple example would be that if you want to do unit testing, we've talked about that before, and unit testing assumes that you have self-contained units that can be tested in isolation without reference to the entire code, and often an old, older code will not be organized that way. Um, here's one that's perhaps more subtle. Shared ownership of code. Um, it's often considered best practice for modern codes that um, any developer can go in 
and work in any section of the code if they need to, as opposed to some older projects that have more of a gatekeeper model where, oh, this person owns this part of the code and you can't change anything in that part without consulting with them. That can um, sometimes put limitations on how much you can change the code. But in order to have the shared ownership, that assumes that you've got understandable code that any developer can go in and look at and reason about how it works and how it fits into the larger picture without having to uh, talk to an expert in the code. And again, many times older codes aren't organized well enough for that to be possible. And perhaps the gatekeeper model is the best you can do in that case. I could go on with other examples, but I, I hope that gives you the idea that, um, that an older code may not, as it's written, um, satisfy the assumptions that a best practice has built into it. So as a result of that, um, if you want to change the practices in a project, you may find that that has to go in hand in hand with changing the code. Um, that might run counter to what you think at first. You think that best, processes will, best practices will improve your code, and that's true, but you may also have to do some code changes to start up before you can bring in the best process. And that might be a little daunting. It may, may make starting the process harder than it otherwise would be. But the good thing is that once the process does start, you, it can become a virtuous cycle. You make some changes to the code that enable a new practice. That new practice enables more improvements to the code, which enables another best practice. And you can get into a cycle where these things keep building on each other. So in the end, it'll, it can be a very effective way to uh, improve your code and your process at the same time. So um, in a minute, I'll switch gears to talk about what this would look like um, in a case study. What would this look like to put all this into practice? But before I go on, um, let me ask if there are any questions on what I've said so far. Hi, Charles. I just checked both the Google Doc and WebEx chat, and I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you for pausing, though. Okay. And your audio is sounding better. Thank you. Okay, good. I'm glad. All right. Well, there will be other stops for questions later on if things do come up. All right. Just as I said that, we did get a question. Okay. Um, so it, the question is, is, any suggestions on addressing the social side of the best practice startup inertia? Uh, useful code was written with best practices of the time. Um, I'll say a bit more about that in the next section, so stay tuned and see if, see if this answers your question. Thank you. So I'd like to switch now into a case study of what we've done at LANL working on the X-RAGE code. Um, let me give you a little bit of background on the code first to understand the context. X-RAGE is an Eulerian AMR radiation hydrodynamics code. Uh, it's an original code that's, the, the original code was written in about 1990, so it's um, coming up on 30 years old. Um, and it's a code that has been used successfully in several application areas and continue, continues to be used in those application areas. I've got pictures of a few of them on the side of the slide here. Uh, asteroid impact simulations, shape charge experiments, and inertial confinement fusion simulations are all done regularly with the X-RAGE code. Now, behind the scenes, the code contains about 470,000 lines of source code, and that is just the code that the X-RAGE project itself maintains. That's not counting a number of third-party libraries that we pull in from other groups at LANL and from elsewhere. The code is mostly Fortran 90. There's some C and C++ that's been incorporated, but the majority of it is Fortran 90. And currently our parallelism model is MPI only. Um, there is talk of moving to um, OpenMP or other models, but that's, that's in the future at this point. 
So a, a few years ago, about four or five years, um, we started to realize that there was going to be a need for modernizing the X-RAGE code. At that time, there had been over 20 years of work um, under fairly high pressure to meet the needs of our users, to meet uh, mission deliverables and so forth. And it had been done in this high pressure, write the code quickly mode. And as a result, X-RAGE was left with a lot of technical debt that had built up over the years. And because of that, it was difficult for the team to understand the code flow or the data flow, uh, to maintain the code and keep the current capabilities working. It was difficult to add new features as more and better physics was needed for the simulations. It was difficult to train new developers as our older staff retired. That was a particular issue. Um, we have a demographic issue at Los Alamos that we're in the middle of a huge wave of retirements of our older staff, and we're having to bring new people on to take over their work, and it's been difficult to do that. Uh, we've all, we're also confronted with the problem that we have to refactor for advanced architectures. And we have the Trinity architecture at Los Alamos. It's a, an Intel Knight's Landing that has just come online in the past couple of years. They have the Sierra that's going to be coming online at Livermore that is an NVIDIA GPU platform, and we'll be having to support that as well. And the, the thought of refactoring our code to support those was a little bit daunting. So all of those factors, um, especially the last two that I put in, in italics, those made us realize that things needed to change at, in the way that we were going about the project. So as we started to make those change, I think the first and most important prerequisite for going about that change was to get management support for changing the culture. And as I mentioned before, um, a lot of the issues that uh, codes face are driven by management, by the decisions they make on how the project is going to be done. And in our case, we were fortunate that our management saw the need for doing things differently and was willing to make some changes in the way that things had been done. Uh, for instance, they added a computer science co-lead to the project. Uh, before this, there had been a single project lead who was always from the domain science background, the, from the physics side. And um, so the project leadership had very little knowledge of the computer science issues. By bringing on a co-lead who came more from the computer science side, we were able to get a better representation of those concerns in, in planning the project. Uh, resources were shifted um, to support more um, computer science and software engineering staff. Previously, it had been a very lopsided balance um, toward the physics expertise, and things were shifted as part of this change so that we had closer to a balance between the physics and the CS side. We allocated part of the domain scientist's time to working on this modernization work as opposed to just working on new physics features or bug fixes in the physics features to actually do some of this refactoring that we would find we needed to do. And in order to make all of those things work, management was willing to commit to um, scale back to new things in the code, to new physics features being developed, to uh, milestone commitments that had to drive a lot of what the project did. Management was willing to scale back on that so that we could have room to make these other, the room and have the resources and the schedule time to do these other things we were talking about doing. That was the first prerequisite for going forward with the modernization project. Um, a second prerequisite was our regression test suite. Uh, before this effort started, there was a regression test suite in the project. Um, it wasn't, it existed, it was not very well maintained so that a lot of the time most of the tests or many of the tests would be failing and only perhaps right before 
a release, would there be a big effort to get tests working again? Um, as refactoring started, we realized that that wasn't going to be sufficient. So we had a got a renewed commitment from the team. The team agreed to work harder on keeping the tests passing on a regular basis. The wall of green, we've called it. Um, I've shown a sample of the nightly emails that got set out, sent out as to you know, whether the tests were passing or not. And we tried to maintain as much as we could the, uh, the, the big green block that indicated that all the tests were passing. At, so, yeah? so Charles, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, we're getting kind of a backlog of questions here. Would this be a good time to ask you some of them? Uh, I think we can do that, yes. All right. So um, the first one I see here is that um, people are interested to know what the amount of funding was required to make the cultural shift on the X-Range project. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know exactly the answer to that. Uh, I do know that it was a combination of having some new funding that came specifically for advanced architecture support that was combined with uh, that was combined with redirection of some of the existing resources for the um, physics folks to support that. Um, I would guess probably about three FTEs on the CS side. Um, were added to the project, and that was combined with maybe, I'm guessing, two or three FTEs worth of the physicist's time being redirected. Um, and this is a project that had something like 12 or 15 FTEs altogether. So I don't know the exact numbers, but that that would be a good order of magnitude, I think. Okay. Um, and then sort of along those lines, is, would you argue that domain science leadership should defer to CS leadership on issues related to software development? And is that a typical approach in your organization? Uh, that, that's a hard that's question. Uh, at least in what I've seen, we have a fairly good track record of the um, of the physics lead and the computer science lead working together. The the CS lead has primary input into the CS issues. The physics lead lead has primary input into the physics issues, but they work together to figure out how to balance those and. Um, and balance the competing constraints on what do we want to do with the code that we have and the resources that we have. And at least from what I've seen, that's been fairly successful. And then kind of the last question um, is, when changing practices and codes, will the process by which best practices emerge be documented as well? Will it be documented as well? Um, we the, the process by which they emerge, was that what the question said? Um, I think the question is asking you are, you, are you documenting or have you documented these new best practices when, when things are changing? Uh, we have been, um, one of the things we've been doing is we've been using a uh, project wiki, um, in our case it's um, Atlass Atlassian and Confluence, to start documenting what are the practices that we are doing? How are we changing them? And having that as a central repository for the team to refer to uh, has been a big help. And that's a good question. That is actually not something I thought to mention in the slides, but that has been a big part of what we've been doing, is having that um, central repository of information. All right, thank you. Pardon the interruption, but I think that answered all of the current questions. Thank you. Okay. Everyone keep those questions coming. That's, they're very helpful. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. Where did I leave off? Um, so in our regression test suite, 
Uh, at first, all of the tests we had were integrated tests that test the, tested the entire X-Rage binary on various capabilities. That was enough to get the process started. As time went on and we reorganized the code, we were able to start adding unit tests as well. And um, you can't see it on this sample that I've given, but part of what's sent out now is a, um, is a combination of the integrated tests that we've traditionally had and unit test results as well. And that's all part of the nightly regression. We do have nightly and weekly test runs that are automated, that you know, run overnight with no intervention. Uh, the results are generated, they're emailed out to the team in the mornings and at the beginning of the week so that we have a constant, um, a con or that we're constantly able to see how our test suite is doing and to see quickly if there are issues that need to be addressed. And perhaps the most important thing that's come out of all of this is now that we have these tests running reliably, the tests can serve as a safety net as we do our refactoring and start making changes to the code. We can see quite quickly if anything is broken. With those two things in place, we, we had to think about the question, what did we want to tackle first in terms of modernize the modernizing the code? As we were starting on the process and trying to figure out what to do, um, several possible tasks were suggested. Um, one was moving to a modern build system from the, um, from the ad hoc, um, from the homegrown built system that we had at the beginning, should we perhaps move to something more modern such as CMake? Should we implement unit testing in the code? Should we clean up the tangled dependency structure? That um, you can see, to give you an idea of what this is talking about, I've, got, I've shown the graph here of what things looked at at the beginning of this process. You can't quite see it at this resolution, but there are about 40 white boxes in that diagram that represent different direct subdirectories in the source tree. And wherever you see a blue line, that is where one depends on another by um, that where one depends on another due to either calling a routine or by using data from that from the other directory. And where you see some red lines in the middle, that is actually a circular dependency where two packages each depend on the other. And as you can probably guess, having the um, there were there were problems with having a code that was this complicated. So we thought about those tasks and we decided that the thing we really needed to do was the code cleanup first. And that was for a couple of reasons. One was that the cleaner code was going to have an immediate benefit in terms of making things more understandable and making it possible to um, understand things in pieces rather than as a whole. Uh, the other reason was that seemed to be a higher priority than the other things we were considering. When you have a hairball code like this, you really can't do unit tests. You can't take pieces and test them in isolation because they are so interconnected. Um, as far as changing the build system, we could do CMake on a hairball code like this. But that's not really the way CMake was designed to be used. So we, making that transition on the code in this form was perhaps not going to be the best use of our resources, was not going to buy us as much as doing the code cleanup was. And um, I've seen um, a few questions um, flashing by on the chat line, and um, some of them I think will be answered in the next few slides. So hopefully this will help. So we went about cleaning up the code and untangling all the dependencies that had built up in the code. And as I said, the root of the problem was that we were set up in a way that any file could use data or call routines from any other file. And um, in order to change this, um, the strategy we chose was to start with the existing code base and change it in place. In other words, we, aren't, we weren't going to go off for a length of time and do a big refactor and only then bring all the work back. We were going to do it in stages so that 
the users would, you know, in real time, be uh, be working with the changes that we were making, and we would get um, feedback pretty quickly if we had disrupted anything that they needed to do. Um, our, our goal in making the changes was to separate code into what we would call packages. We wanted to have related functionality grouped together in a single package with a well-defined interface with the rest of the code instead of having just code calls and data uses sticking in anywhere to have a simpler and well-defined interface. And by going through this process, we wanted to move toward a cleaner and simpler design for the code over time. Some of the techniques that we used to make this happen, one was um, I had mentioned that there was a lot of use of data from other uh, Fortran use statements that would grab data from other packages. Um, we, what we did was to minimize that was to create dot derived types for the packages to encapsulate their package state. <coughs> Excuse me. And we would pass that state through the argument lists for the routines um, so that instead of having one routine directly grab the data from another, it would have that passed in by an argu argument from a higher level routine. Another technique that we used was finding misplaced code uh, and move it to a more appropriate place in the package structure. Somebody might write a functionality that they needed in a place that was really convenient at the time that they wrote it, but when we went back and looked at it more closely, we would see that, well, this really belongs in this other package. It's more closely related to what's there. And making that kind of movement of code uh, cleaned up a lot of the dependencies. Uh, in some cases, we would lift function calls that one package made to another, lift those up to a higher level package. Um, in particular, we did this a lot with calls that were used for coupling the physics. So for instance, um, if say hydro would run and then radiation would run, somebody perhaps as a convenience at the end of hydro um, would put a call to radiation. And that wasn't wrong, that got the job done, but it wasn't really inherent in the hydro package that you had to do that. So we would perhaps pull that call to a higher level driver or something that dictated the coupling of hydro to radiation instead of having the hydro package itself do it. And we made a number of changes in that form that uh, cleaned up the dependency structure. And finally, something that we did um, was to deprecate and remove unneeded function calls or unneeded data uses. Uh, in a lot of cases, there was vestigial code where data was pulled in that was needed at one time but wasn't anymore. Or when there was a functionality that was sitting in the code that drove certain function calls but nobody was using that functionality anymore we were able to identify some of those and start removing them from the start removing them from the code and again that cleaned up some of the dependencies that we saw so um, the graph i showed you earlier was from october of 14 i've got another graph here that was that was from january 2016 so that was after about 15 months of the kind of work i've been talking about here and the process I've described led us to a much simpler graph that you see in the figure at right. And the biggest thing that you can see is that the graph is now levelized. Um, what you perhaps can't see at, at low resolution, but all of the arrows in the graph are pointing downward. There's nothing pointing upward, so there are no cycles in the graph. And that enables you to see very easily the dependency that the, how the dependencies are set up. Um, another benefit that's gone along with that is that the interfaces between the packages that we have in this form are much better defined than they were in the earlier code. Um, I won't say they're perfectly defined, but they're much better than they were. The, uh, nearly all the data dependencies have been pulled into arguments and 
nearly all of the function calls are from a small, well-defined interface rather than ranging all over the code. And the result of these transformations is that it's now easier to understand and reason about what the code is doing and how the different pieces of it fit together. And that, that's a big benefit right there. Excuse me. The other thing we found is that once we had made this change, that then enabled a lot of other changes on a per package basis, since it made a lot more sense in this form to start making changes to the packages in isolation behind the uh, interfaces that we have set up. Um, some of the changes that we're now able to make after this are um, adding unit testing to the packages, um, adding documentation to the packages, um, particularly interface documentation, and both of those make a lot more sense when you have the self-contained packages. Code cleanup can now be done. We have a lot of that underway. Most of that is being done within packages and behind the interfaces. There is still some refining of interfaces as we find better ways to do things, but for the most part, the cleanup is taking place within packages. But we have uh, performance optimizations that are taking place. Um, again, a lot of that is on a per package basis. And we're having physics improvements that can be done. It's easier to think about how to modify methods or add new methods from behind these per package interfaces that we've um, put in. That was our first task. That has been a great success and it has led to other follow-on tasks. So where we are now is, um, as I've said um, earlier, we have levelized the dependency graph. We've organized things into packages. Along with that, we have done a refactor to our build system to use um, libraries for building the different packages. And by doing that, enforce the levelization so that now that we've done all that cleanup, we don't accidentally undo it. We have that locked into place by the build system. We are adding unit tests now that we do have the packages that can be treated as units. We have the infrastructure complete for adding unit tests to the code. Uh, the writing of tests is ongoing. As of right now, we have a little over half of the 40-some packages have some level of unit testing in place, and we are working to improve that. We have documentation of packages that has started. We have a few key packages done, and that's going to be an ongoing process. We have code cleanup within packages, and that is an ongoing process. We have um, work being done on performance optimization of different aspects of the code, and again, that's an ongoing process. Uh, we are starting to move from a homegrown build system that we've been using into a CMake build. We have a prototype of that that's been done, and we're starting to think about now how to bring the prototype up to production grade. We're going to be moving from our subversion version control that we've been using to uh, Git and GitLab, and that's in the planning stages. We also have, um, plan we are planning to set up um, GitLab CI for continuous, in continuous integration for the code. And again, that's in the planning stages. So let me stop there now and take some more questions. Hey, Charles, uh, yeah, uh, there are some questions here. Um, let's see. Um, were there any particular tools other than CS eyeballs used to identify where these various kinds of changes would help? Um, I have a slide coming up that will address that. Okay, so then, how do you confirm that code you remove is not being used anymore? Uh, we, for the most part, um, our physicists are in enough contact with the user community that the physicist who knows a particular functionality has a pretty good sense of this is being used, this is not. Um, we've sometimes been able to uh, supplement that with we have some database tracking that to a limited degree tracks what features of the code are being used um, in production. 
and we've been able to use that in some, to, in some cases, confirm that something is being used or is not being used. Another one here, did feature development stop during all this cleanup time? Feature development did not stop, it did slow some. We had um, our management picked out a few key features that they thought were most important and development on those went on in parallel with the work we're talking about here. But the, the number of features was much smaller than it would have traditionally been. Uh, what are you using for your homegrown build system? GNU Make? Uh, it, is, it is GNU Make um, with um, a lot of, um, a lot of project in, uh, homegrown infrastructure built around GNU Make. Uh, another one, another question. Were there issues with private branches of users that were used, for example, to develop new features? Uh, private branches of um, users, did you say? Yes. Um, we have, um, one thing that's been key to this is we have, over time, discouraged users from doing their own private builds of the code and standardized on using either um, either released versions or, in some cases, um, head versions of the master branch. And um, except in very rare cases, we've not given branches to the users. And in those cases, they were very friendly users who um, understood that we were doing something exceptional and didn't do it for a long period of time. Okay, this is an interesting question here, I think. Was a rewrite, rewrite ever considered instead of fixing or cleaning up? Uh, yes, a rewrite was considered. There was actually, there's actually been a lot of discussion on that point. And um, when we were discussing that, um, what we came to realize was that writing a new code was a possibility, but it was a much harder task than many people realized. Because in order to rewrite a code, to take over the functionality of a code that you have, you have to first figure out what the old code does, which in many cases is not at all obvious in a code that is convoluted and not well documented. So you have to figure out what the code does. Then you have to write the code. Then you have to do all the V and V to prove that the new code does what the old one does in all the cases that your users are interested in. And you have to do your V and V not only to your own satisfaction, but to the user's satisfaction as well, and this was going to be a process of several years if we followed through with it, even in the best case. Um, so the decision was made based on taking all those things into account to do a rewrite. Um, th that was the decision we made for our projects. Um, I'm not going to say that that's the best choice for all projects. But it is a decision where you really have to weigh everything, including the hidden costs of trying to write a new code. And I think the last one, uh, question for this uh, part here before we finish, uh, it's related, I think, one of the previous questions. To one of the previous questions. Uh -huh. what, is the, what is the justification for moving from GNOMake to CMake, since uh, GNOMake is reliable ac across virtually all architectures? Uh, GNU Make is indeed reliable across all architectures, but the um, infrastructure that we built on top of it um, was working fairly reliably, but it was so complex that there was only one person who one person on the project who truly understood it. Um, and you know, there's the old danger of if this person wins the lottery, you know, the and decides to quit, the whole process. The whole project is going to have a very hard time understanding the system to continue to do work. So the idea was by making the transition to CMake, which has more standardized ways of providing the functionality that some of this infrastructure had, that you would have something that could be understandable by more people. 
and reduce that risk of being one person thin in running the build system. Okay, uh, one observation I'd like to make here, a comment to the participants, is that we are basically uh, taking the, all the questions and consolidating them into uh, this Google Doc uh, that we have a link to, and we are going to ask the speaker, Charles, to go uh, through the questions afterwards and, and, and answer them again, right? So okay, so write down what I've done. I can do yes, that. I, yes, yeah. So please then, Charles, go ahead with the, your slide. Okay. So based on our experience, we have some recommendations that we would make to other projects that would go through a similar kind of process of moving towards uh, modern practices and modernized code for a long-running project. And the first and most crucial one I would say is get management support. To make a process like this work, there has to be culture change. You have to make changes in the culture that better reflect the new things that you want to do, and management has to be supportive of that. And as I said, we were very fortunate in um, the x ray project that our management was supportive and was willing to make some pretty significant changes. Another important thing is to use regression tests as your safety net as you do any sort of code refactoring to um, to verify that you aren't breaking anything, that you're continuing to do what you did before correctly. Uh, another, another thing, which I've touched on a little bit, is to resist the temptation to move to a shiny new tool just because it's shiny and new. Um, there's a temptation, particularly among people who are accustomed to more modern computer science practices, to say, let's move to this new tool. And while there's value in that, it can also be very disruptive if the project has one tool it's using and you're making the transition to a different tool that is disruptive in many cases. And you only want to do that if the value that you will get out of, the, out of making the transition will make up for the disruption that you've gone through. Um, so you want to prioritize whatever tasks you take on and whatever changes you make by value they will add to the process and to the users. Um, an example of that and what I went through earlier is that when we were considering um, code cleanup versus CMake, um, we decided that at the beginning of the process, CMake was not going to add enough value to make the disruption worthwhile. And now, a few years later, we've reached a point where it is worthwhile to make that transition. And finally, I would say, Find the right balance between doing code and process improvement and supporting your users. Because at the end of the day, what your project is there for is to enable the users to do the things they need to do and do them well. And you want to support them in what they're doing now, while at the same time doing things, moving toward a way of doing things that will keep enabling your users 5, 10, maybe even 20 years down the road. So you have to find the balance between those two priorities. Both of them are important, and you have to consider them as you're thinking about how to do things. So some resources we found that were helpful. Um, a couple of general resources that we found very useful are Lakosh's book on large-scale C++ design. Now, this is a book from 1996. It was using a very, very early version of C++. So some of the specific techniques that are in that book are outdated. But even so, the general principles as to how you want to organize code with an eye toward making a larger code project work well, the general principles are still very much relevant. And they're relevant to all languages, not just C++. Um, another resource that we found very useful was Feather's book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. And I know one of, the, one of the big points that he makes is the point that I've made about uh, regression testing. And he goes into a lot more detail about that, among other things. Uh, if you'd like to see some more details on the work we did in X-Rage, I have a link to, my, uh, to the supercomputing poster that we did a couple of years ago. You're welcome to take a look at that. And then some tools that we found useful in the process. And I think I saw somebody was asking how we did the uh, dependency graphs. 
was a combination of two things. Um, we're using Understand, which is a static visual analysis tool. Um, it's a commercial tool that we found very helpful. It allows you to visualize a lot of code dependencies between packages and within packages. Um, we use that together with GraphViz, which helped with our graph visual visualization for the dependency graphs and was able to do some cleanup graph some cleanup of graphs that Understand was not able to do by itself. Uh, we also introduced um, unit test frameworks, as I mentioned. We used PFUnit for our Fortran code and Google Test for our C and C++ code. And with that, that's all the materials I have. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your good questions. And I'll take any more questions that people have now. Yeah, there is one here, Charles. Um, what if management supports the idea of change, but is unable to throw any money behind it? That's a good question. Um, we, um, as, as I said earlier in response to somebody else's question, we had a combination of um, we had a combination of new money and redirection of existing money. I think if there's no new money available, um, you could still do the sort of thing we're talking about just by redirecting existing money, although the scope might have to be smaller and the timeline longer. I think it could still be done. If management thinks it's sufficiently important to redirect some resources, that can be done. Uh, any tips when the push to software engineering best practices is a grassroots movement and not from the top down? Let's see. That's hard to make a general statement. Um, I guess the best indicator I would say is if things um, plan if there is planning, if aspects like planning and staffing and um, training and career development, if there's not movement to change those things, then the effort is likely to just stay at a grassroots level, would be my guess. Okay, so I think there is another one here question that has been restated. Are there any suggestions for commencing code cleanup and integration of best practices into a long-lived code? How to approach experienced domain experts about refactoring for modern architectures and maintainability without alienating them? Okay. Well, I think, I think that's a good question. Um, what we've done on XRAGE is we have um, recognized and been very clear that the domain experts are, an, are a very important part of the project. They know how the science in the code works, and they know what is needed to support the users in a way that the computer scientists do not. And what we want to do is leverage that expertise and say, uh, for instance, when doing code cleanup, that has often been done by a computer science person and a domain expert uh, working together, or perhaps by, a, by the domain scientists having, having gotten some ideas from, uh, from the computer science folks as to what sorts of things would be useful. Um, we had some uh, computer scientists take the lead in refactoring some of the uh, infrastructure packages, and that served as, as an example that the domain scientists could look at. I think uh, the other thing that I would add to that is for advanced architectures, we have also tried to, uh, we have tried to again make that a um, make that a joint effort between the CS and the domain science side. Um, we perhaps have the CS people take a little bit more of the lead on that, but in some cases some of our domain scientists have um, worked with them, picked up what needed to happen, and taken on some of that work as well. So it very much needs to be a collaborative process 
And I think for the most part, that has been, um, that has worked very well on both sides. The, the, both sides have recognized the expertise of the other and not felt threatened because it's complementary expertise and not replacement expertise. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, so we are over time already, but let's take the final question here. Any tips for smaller development teams, say one or two developers and one tester? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I would say you could probably, if it is a smaller project, um, you would have to, obviously you can devote um, smaller resources you would have fewer resources to devote than a large project, but at the same time, your user commitments would be smaller than on a large project if, if your team is that small. So I would think, and this is just a guess on my part, I've not tried it, but I would think that in a scaled down fashion, something like this would be applicable. Right. Anything else? No, I think, yeah, there is another one here, but basically I think if people would like to disconnect, I'll just, uh, we can continue afterwards here, but I just want to basically um, announce here, take the opportunity to uh, announce the next webinar in the series, uh, which is going to be at the end of February on Jupyter Notebooks for HPC. Uh, so again, so we'd like to improve the series. Please give your feedback through this uh, Google Doc. And these slides and the report will be available at these two websites. So with that, uh, Charles, thank you very much. But as I said, people would like to stick around for a little while. Uh, we have.